Well, here I am in New York, wondering how Sophia Hopgood got mixed up with Nazi spies. It's today's paper. Glad to see a wing of plebs. Having problems, maniac? About well, time you guys showed up. You know the drill. Go get them. Gotcha. Let's go out to the courtyard for some target practice. Ready your bow. Knock an arrow and draw back the string by holding down the attack button. Make sure you draw all the way back, or your shot will not have full power. Yes, 
reinforcements yes, have arrived. Okay, let's do this. Let's build this computer. Just like in some of my last videos, I'm going to use time lapse to show you me building the computer. And in the meantime, I will talk about the components, why I chose them, anything to watch out for. Do check the description of this video. Any uh, links I talk about, any drivers, any videos I refer to, I'll put all the links in the description. So let's start with talking about the case. It's an A1, A1 923 U3 NP. Very cheap, $57 and includes a 500 watt power supply. It's got four 5.25 inch drive bays and one three and a half quarter inch uh, from external. And internally, you can put in six hard drives. It's got the usual power LED, a reset button, hard drive LED, so it's all there. The supplied 500 watt power supply is of extreme quality. The 500 watt rating doesn't do this power supply any justice. In reality, it's closer to 900 watts. It can easily handle SLI and Crossfile. Now, let's be honest, it is garbage, but this computer draws very little power, so it won't be a problem. Next up, you have to insert the motherboard standoffs. They come with the case in a little bag, as well as the 632 and the M3 screws. I usually use a permanent marker and I just highlight the uh, holes where the motherboard standoffs go. I also insert the IO shield and I use a little tool to just tighten those standoffs a little bit to make sure that everything is nice and secure. The choice of motherboard and processor is very important. The whole idea of this project is to end up with a computer that can run at four different speed modes. So we will have a machine that can be turned into a 386, a 486, a Pentium, and finally running at full speed. The motherboard we need to use for this project is called a SuperSocket 7 motherboard. And the main reason is to be compatible with the chip we're gonna use. It's an AMD K62 Plus or AMD K63 Plus because that chip allows you to set the processor cache through software as well as change the multiplier. And that way we can configure our machine to run as a 386, 486 Pentium or at full speed. The motherboard I'm using is the Gigabyte GA5AX. Very good motherboard, but there are lots of other options. I have reviewed a few SuperSocket 7 motherboards that are suitable for this project. I will put the reviews in the description. The process I'm going for is the AMD K6 3 Plus 400 megahertz. It is the 1.6 volt version, so it's very power efficient. It has 256 kilobyte of cache, so that helps with some of the later Windows games. So I'm just applying some thermal paste and attaching the cooler so that the processor doesn't overheat. And it needs to be a K62 Plus or K63 Plus in order to be able to change the CPU multiplier on the fly through software. And that will work in Windows as well as in DOS. Configure the motherboard with a 66 megahertz frontside bus. SuperSocket 7 boards do support 100 MHz frontside bus, but we will have more flexibility if we go with the 66 MHz frontside bus. Set the multiplier to 6x on the motherboard, so that will give you the full speed, which is 400 MHz, and then through software, if we need to slow it down, we just do that. At this point, I wanna talk about the graphics card. I'm going for a 3 defects Voodoo 3 3500, the AGB version. One downside of this card is it runs very hot. So I've done a little mod and I've done a video that shows you how to do it. I'll put it down in the description. It's a nice 80 uh, millimeter fan, keeps the card nice, cool and quiet. And because I have to do some cable management with the uh, fan cables, I'm doing that right now. But there's lots, lots to talk about the graphics card because there are a lot of choices uh, you have. SuperSocket 7 motherboards are known for having chipsets that have some issues with AGP video cards. And the 3 dfx Voodoo card, although it's an AGP card, doesn't actually use any of the AGP features. That means that you're avoiding any chipset issues straight away. So this, this card is very highly compatible with SuperSocket 7 machines. The image quality is fantastic. 
It's very compatible with uh, early and later DOS games. It has really good performance with the AMD K6 processors. Other graphics card, the kind of graphics cards, they need a fast processor to uh, drive the pixels. It is very compatible with the uh, 3D games. The 3 dfx Voodoo was a card that every game developer, every publisher made sure that their game was working with a Voodoo card. So you will not run into big uh, issues with your games. In terms of memory, I'm using a 128 megabyte PC 133 SD RAM stick. You could go with some more memory, but I found 128 to be perfect for this machine. All the games you've seen in the first part worked fine with 128 megabyte. Now comes another aspect of building that I don't enjoy particularly, and that's figuring out the front header connector. So I printed out a little diagram and I labeled it beforehand, and I always challenge myself Will I be able to hook up everything correctly and all the lights and everything will work on the first go? In this case, yes, it did. Um, with the LEDs, you just got to be careful. They have polarity. So if an LED doesn't work, just swap the cable around and it should come on. After that, all you have to do is put the motherboard inside of the case and secure the uh, motherboard using the screws through the standoffs. For the sound card, because this motherboard has an ISA slot and we are interested in DOS gaming, you should definitely go for an ISA sound card. I'm going with the Yamaha Audition 32 Plus. It's got a real Opel 3 chip, a wavetable header, no hanging note box, and it's compatible with the Windows Sound System standard for some 16-bit high definition audio. Um, you can listen to a demonstration in the Turrican 2 game in part one of this video. For MIDI, general MIDI to be precise, I'm using the Dream Blaster S1. That's a brand new wavetable module that uh, a chap in Belgium has developed and is selling this uh, device out of his uh, website for 30 euros, including postage. Really good sound, very good value, and definitely lifts the MIDI sound quality of this machine. So I'm just inserting it into the machine and that's it. We're ready to go for the next part. So in this part, we're going to have a look at some storage options. I will insert a hard drive, but also a hard drive bay, which allows it to be easily removed. We're going to install a DVD RW drive and as featured in lots of my videos, a GoTek floppy emulator, which allows you to use a USB stick and have 100 floppy images on it. Very useful, I highly recommend it with uh, every, every system that I build. Now, the hard drive solution, those who have watched my video before, I'm using modern SATA hard drives. In this case, uh, it's a two terabyte hard drive using Seagate C tools. I've limited the capacity to 120 gigabytes. So it's basically 120 gigabyte hard drive. And then I'm using a SATA to ID adapter to convert to the ID interface that's on the motherboard. So the SATA to ID uh, converter goes at the back of the hard drive uh, bay. So it's a removable bay where you can pull out the hard drive. The DVD drive is a stock standard ID drive. It's got CD analog audio port at the back because a lot of the games from this era will use a uh, CD playback for music. And now comes another activity I really don't enjoy a lot and that's hooking up all the power leads and doing a bit of cable management. So we're gonna put some power leads to the motherboard, to our storage devices, the floppy emulator, the hard drive and also the DVD drive. We also need to route the CD audio cable from the back of the CD, dr CD DVD drive to the sound card for the uh, CD to mix the CD audio output signal into the mixer of the sound card. So I'm just gonna fa fast forward everything and um, then we're gonna move on to the, to the next part. Okay, and now comes the moment we've all been waiting for. Will it post? Will we get the post beep? Is everything working? So hooked it up to a keyboard mouse, speakers and my monitor and we're just firing it up and making sure that everything works.
great, everything is working. So next I'm gonna tweak the bars a little bit. I usually start by loading the defaults and then I do things such as auto detecting the hard drive, setting the boot order. I usually disable the serial and the parallel port to free up some resources. I enable USB keyboard support because I'm using a wireless Logitech K400 keyboard to sit in the background and control everything. I'm also setting the RAM timings to the fastest timing possible, which is cache latency 2, and a few other settings which you can just see on the screen. Okay, so we're ready to install Windows. I'm installing Windows 98 SE. This is gonna be a really quick part. I'm just gonna fast forward everything. Once this is done, I'm gonna switch over to direct screen capture and show you how to install the drivers and configure Windows and MS-DOS mode. Okay, so here I'm just enabling DMA mode for better hard drive performance. You just do that through device manager. It's a property of the hard drive. Tick the box, press OK, and then reboot your machine. Now what I did now is insert my USB flash drive, which has all the drivers on it. I didn't show installing the USB flash drive driver. I'll put a link in the description where you can get it from. Um, so you can see it just configures it and then I'll proceed to copy some of the drivers onto the desktop before inst running the installations. Okay, now I'm installing the Voodoo 3DFX driver. So just run startup and everything gets installed. Okay, next I'm running the overclock utility that will enable overclocking, but also access to VSync options to enable and disable VSync for direct X games and also OpenGL and Glide games. Next up, I'm installing the Yamaha sound drivers. I'm using the latest uh, website drivers from the Yamaha website. I'll put in a link in my description so you can download it from there. And this part is a bit tedious. It involves setting up MS-DOS mode. So you have a working mouse, CD-ROM driver, all the memory options, conventional memory, XMS memory, EMS memory in MS-DOS, as well as a working sound card and all of that. Now the steps, uh, they're not hard, but they're quite um, involving. So rather than showing this in this video, I've actually made a separate video that talks about configuring MS-DOS mode and I'm just gonna put a link to that in the description because otherwise this video is just gonna to be too long and uh, too tedious. But all the files are ready to copy paste. So you have a config sys and an order exec batch files and you can just copy that um, as shown in the video. And once you've done all of that, you can shut down into MS-DOS mode and you'll get my uh, boot menu that has, has all the options for memory and if you want a mouse or a CD-ROM drive. It's the same boot menu I use uh, in all my videos. I've also got a version for plain MS-DOS 6.22 if you're interested. Again, I'll put a video link in the description. And as you see, it loads the CD-ROM driver, um, now the sound, the sound card driver, um, the mouse is working and everything is good to go under MS-DOS. Okay, this is the last part of the video. Thank you for persevering. It's quite a long video, but I wanted to make sure that everything is contained in this video and that you can go out there and replicate what I'm showing you here. So in order to switch between the speed modes, we will turn on and off caches and also change the multiplier. There are two main caches we have to change. One is called the CPU cache and the other one is called the motherboard cache. And for example, uh, 386, we turn both caches off, whereas in the 486, we leave the CPU cache off and turn on the motherboard cache. In Pentium mod, we turn on both caches, 
but we leave the multiplier at the 2x setting, whereas under full, full speed, we ramp up the clock speed by changing the multiplier to 6x. The CPU cache and the motherboard cache can be changed in the BIOS. You need to look for the options L1 cache, which is the CPU cache, and L2 cache, which refers to the motherboard cache. The CPU cache can also be configured through software. The tool I'm using is called SetMul, and I will put um, a link in the description of where you can download it. So the CPU cache can be changed in software while you're running Windows or DOS, but the motherboard cache can only be changed in the BIOS. In order to change the multiplier, we can also use some software. Um, again, in DOS, we're using setmul. Very easy and very straightforward to use. In Windows, you might actually not really have to change the multiplier at all. Just leave it at the full speed. But if you need to change it, there is a Windows utility. I'll also put it down in the description. And we've got a video footage um, here where you can see how it works. And now all you need to do is figure out what game runs best at which speed mode. For example, I've got Wing Commander here. If you have the CPU cache enabled, it is way too fast. And another game that has issues is Space Quest V. Even with the caches uh, disabled, if you're running at 400 megahertz clock speed, it won't initialize the sound blaster, it throws an error. But if you reduce the multiplier and run at 133 megahertz, then the sound blaster gets detected fine. No video review is complete without some benchmarks. So we're kicking it off with the hard drive benchmark ATTO. Disk benchmark, the controller on this motherboard supports the ATA66 standard and we're getting close to that theoretical performance. So that's the modern hard drive together with the SATA 2 RDA controller in action. And here we have the DOS benchmarks of the 4-in-1 computer with all the four modes. So you can use that and compare it with your existing 386 or whatever other machine you have and you just want to see um, how it stacks up. The benchmark I'm using is the VGA benchmark suite are put together for a VGA database project. I'll put a description in the link, you can download it. It's a zip file. It's got a, a menu system. You just have to push a few buttons and it does everything for you and spits out some results. It's really easy to compare. And here we have the Windows benchmarks. Now do note that I only benchmarked Windows with full speed. I ran in no, into no situation where I had to slow down my computer. So, but that can vary if you, do have a game that's a bit speed sensitive, then you can use all the same methods and strategies, strategies that we used under DOS. Okay, here we have some overclocking results. Now, usually I don't like to overclock old hardware, but in this case, I'm making an exception because the processor uh, makes it really so easy. Now, do note that I went for 550 megahertz with uh, two volts for the uh, core voltage. AMD never re released a 600 megahertz version um, they did a 570 megahertz version with a really odd front side bus. Um, so I believe there's some internal limitation that prohibited, prohibited them to reach 600 megahertz uh, stably or without uh, insane voltage. So I stopped at 550 and stability was fantastic. I had no issues and you can gain around 30% um, of extra performance. A bit of that has to do with running the front side bus now at 100 megahertz. Um, the downside is that at this setting, you can't slow the machine down as much. So you have to redo some of the benchmarks and see where you end up. But not everyone is into playing those old DOS games. And maybe you just want to have a, a Windows machine that is flexible enough to play some of the old DOS games, but still have as much performance as possible for Windows. And in that case, just reconfigure your uh, jumpers on your motherboard um, and overclock that chip. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching. If you made it all the way to the end, I applaud you. I really enjoyed doing this project. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, watching it and maybe I can inspire a few of you out there to follow in my footsteps and build uh, a similar machine. As always, hit that like button. Any questions, any comments down below, 
do check out the descriptions. A lot of links to this project are in there. And subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so. 